Hi, how you doing, folks? This is Mitch from Hard Intentions YouTube channel. We also have hardintentions.com where we have some really cool stuff. Shirts, hats, art. Check us out. You might find something you like. Hi, right, it's Mitch from Hard Intentions YouTube channel, and uh, we have a guest on here today. Uh, how'd you like to introduce yourself to, uh, to the audience here, please? Uh, Gunner, um, this this thing I'm continue. I'm just making sure there was it. So Gunner is my name, Gunner Lindblom, um, from Detroit, Michigan, uh, 48 years old. Today I'm a, I'm an author. Today I'm a novelist. I write novels for a living, and I have a YouTube okay. channel of my own. All right, so that's your book. I'm assuming in the background. Yeah, I got a two book series right here to be a king volume one and two. You can kind of see them. I also own Art Thing Apparel. So it's a kind of a gangster themed apparel company called Art Thing Apparel. So it's, uh, you know, it was basically yeah. whatever city your whatever city is your city would be, you know, I'd say it on there, New York or Chicago, yeah. LA, Vegas, whatever. Cool. So I got that and I got a YouTube show. Uh, Gunner Detroit is my YouTube show. And I got a radio show, right. mainstream radio show every Friday night out of Detroit. Cool. A couple things. So uh, let's get started. So uh, <clears throat> you're from Detroit originally? Yep, yep. Well, I mean, I was, I was born in Detroit proper, but, excuse me, I, li I was li really lived in, a, in the suburbs, a, a suburb right next to Detroit. And I, I only lived in Detroit City proper a couple of years in my life um, when I lived on my own. Yeah. So I lived in a, kind of a, a rich suburb, called gross point michigan just just borders right against detroit on one side it's ghetto the other side it's multi-million dollar mansions so it's just kind of yeah. how it happened and then i lived in sinclair shores later on i i lived in sinclair shores which is in the next suburb down, which is is ritzy but it's still pretty nice yeah that's uh i think i've seen some of that on the news back in the 90s uh when that Detroit neighborhoods were kind of moving out into the suburbs and the guys weren't liking it. They were chasing people down on the freeways, kind of racial shit going on. And it was on the yeah, world news. That's, that's been going on for a long time, man. So, yeah. so basically Detroit back in the sixties, you know, there was a, you know, I'll just give you a quick story is a lot of like, you know, freed slaves and people from the south felt the press and they got invited to come up and work in detroit at the auto plants and factories and um and they did they did well there and they they made a lot of money and they were pretty much accepted and there was a big italian community there and we'll I'll get into that in a minute i'm italian and um and a lot of the italians who owned the businesses hired black people and everything seemed it was getting along pretty good and then civil rights came along and said well all these few white people got all the, the money and the businesses yada yada so let's march out there and take it smash up their stuff and steal their stuff and rob them and so then basically while the white people who lived in these like, northern suburbs of detroit like well let's get the f out of here i mean yeah. it ain't worth my rent my life and everything we have is stolen every other day so and there's drugs and there's crime so they left it's called white flight and then they got out of there and went to the northern suburbs <clears throat> and to this end to this day you kind of have you know that's the separation there's like a I don't know, the eight mile and there's like a one side it's kind of black ghetto and then the other side but now there's kind of a buffer zone like these the the cities that butt against detroit is right. like mixed it's like 50 50 mixed right. you know so it's so it's better in that regard but um yeah. you know there's still a lot of a lot of a lot of tension if you will yeah. you know in that area that's the reason why i got the hell out of there i got when i got out of prison you know i did 13 years in prison when i got out of prison i'm like i'm never going back to the city man i don't want to be around that i don't want to be yeah. around crime drugs violence idiots you know convicts criminals i don't want to be around none of it so yeah i moved way out in the suburbs <laughs> that's right <laughs> like five uh, hours five hours north of detroit so you uh you're born in detroit and you're you lived in uh you say Detroit proper for a while, and then your family moved out to uh, like suburbs. Well, no, I I, I lived I was no no no. So my grandparents, my or grandma grandpa Toko, and anybody who's from the Detroit area will recognize the name. The Toko name is very synonymous with the mafia. Um, the boss of the Detroit mafia was a guy was a guy named Jack Toko, which is my grandfather's cousin, first cousin, uh, younger cousin, and um. And anyways, they lived in Gross Point their whole life. 
And so I lived with them most, most of my childhood life, um, probably right. like 10, 10, 12 years, because my parents divorced when I was four. Okay. And then after my parents divorced, um, so the only time I lived in Detroit is when I was um, when I was 19 years old. I went and lived with my two cousins on, on Sev Mile. We had our own house, but I ended up in jail. And um, when I got out of jail, I went and lived with my grandparents again, because it's kind of was better for me. You know, I was, right. I was like living with my grandparents. I had it made, I had food <clears> and, <throat> and my laundry done and everything. So, and then, but I took up and selling drugs and, you know, and I had a lot of girls coming and going, it drove my grandparents nuts. So I ended up getting my own house. I ended up moving right. to a house on, in, on state fair in Detroit. And, uh, around this time I was getting heavily involved in the streets, you know, right. a lot of, maf- a lot of mafia stuff, you know, a lot of, um, yeah. I was dealing with some heavyweight, you know, mob guys. Um, so now are you like a teenager at this point or what? Yeah. Yeah. When I was around, well, when I, when I started, look, I went to jail for the steroid thing. I got busted for selling steroids when I was actually 17. Didn't get convicted till I was like 19. Right. Um, Cause I, you know, lawyers dragged it out for a couple of years, a year and a half. And then I ended up going to jail for six months on that, or really it was only three months. So you, uh, I, I got, got busted, busted for steroids when I was a selling teenager. Selling steroids. Yeah. So is that, did they treat that like uh, the same as like selling heroin or something like that? Or yeah. Like- yeah, yeah, it's literally classified as the same controlled substance classification of, of cocaine and and heroin. And the irony of that was when I did the crime, I was involved with a huge steroid ring, which was right. a mafia thing. It also was a mafia thing. There was this guy named Joe DiMaggio. It was a huge steroid operation. Uh, it, it was like 15 different states were involved, like 50 guys, millions of dollars. That was just a tiny little peanut you know what i mean compared in, involved in it but they didn't they didn't bust me because they didn't want to shake the tree so they waited until this big federal indictment on these right. guys came down before they came and bust me but part of us we all believe that really they waited till the law was changed because the law was changed in like january of 1990 that made them that made them like heroin and cocaine right. and the the indictment came in like February of 1990. So they waited till the law was changed and then so came they in changed and, the uh, classification of the, of the crime of the drug. The, yeah. The crime the upgrade before they busted people. Yeah. And they got us all. So I, I ended up in the County jail for five months. I'm my grandpa bribed the lawyer, believe it or not. I don't say, I, excuse me, not a lawyer, but a judge. I don't even say it's a bribe. He just, he went to the, they knew, he knew my grandpa. My grandpa was an old wise guy. Yeah, um, yeah very well known in Detroit of my own. And he, and he invited him to lunch and he gave him 10,000 bucks. And he said, I don't want him to do prison time over this. Um, so ask, it was, was your grandfather involved with the, uh, you know, nefarious activities as well, or was he just, yeah, of, course, uh, of course. All right. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, he, my grand, my grandfather, I won't, I, I don't like to see him in that light. I don't think he was a violent man. Yeah. And I think that's why he, he, I don't think he was ever a made guy in the family. Although yeah. there is some contention over that. Some people believe he might've been, or he might've, uh, I don't think he, in my mind, I don't think he was because I didn't see him as a violent guy, but I never knew him when he was young either. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like a guy worked for Tony Jackaloni which is a very, very violent, famous mobster. He's the guy who was, this is the guy to, um, Jimmy Hoffa was going to meet the day Jimmy Hoffa disappeared with Tony Giacalone. So I knew the guy, but I knew him when he was old and, yeah. you know, older in his fifties and sixties and seventies. And, and uh, he didn't seem like a violent guy, but I know he had killed like 30 people. So, I mean, you yeah. just don't know. Now, my, 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 my grandpa was a bookie is all he was. He loves sports. Well, that's um, the, uh... and he, a lot of guys think, uh, you know, mafia, they think guys run around killing people all the time. But, uh, you know, organized crime, basically, the way I understand, it's all about making money. And so some guys do some things and other guys do other things. And guys that know how yeah. to make money, uh, you know, are not necessarily involved with violence. You know, they're, they're just. Yeah, no, no. And that's especially Detroit, especially Detroit. It's a very quiet, nonviolent type of family. And don't get me wrong. There's been plenty of murders and there's plenty of violence. I was like, I was one of the most violent guys of my era. Um, yeah. And I, and I wasn't as violent as my reputation would have you believe. Right. Everybody thought I was this bone crushing, head cracking <laughs> lunatic who would freaking yeah. they'll knock her teeth out, put a gun in. Her. No, they just heard that. And so right. when I showed up and said, you got to pay, 
or I robbed you, you know, dope deal or something. And then they're like, yeah, what am I going to do? He's, and he tells me I got to give him dope, you know, I take the money. And this guy's a killer, you know what I'm saying? And really, I wasn't even that bad, but they just thought I was. But there's a lot of guys in the family who, who weren't violent. Now, most of the guys weren't violent. They relied on guys me, like me for violence. So if they right. needed violence carried out, they had a guy they could call and they could say, you know, Al, you know, Alonzo, Al or Gunner, whatever they call me. And they'd be like, yo, you know, this guy ain't paying, man. He's running. He, he's kind of spinning me. He's disrespecting me, whatever. Right. Or for whatever message. There was a hundred different times I had to go send a message for various things. Um, and then I would be the guy that they'd come do it because most of the, like the bosses are kind of these like fat old men who, who just want to get their envelopes of money every week from off the streets. And they want to run their businesses and raise their families and go on vacation. They don't want to be bothered with, you know, the drama on the street. And then even the lower level guys who are like the next gen above me, which would be like my, my parents age, those guys had been pruned by those guys above them. So they, those guys are trying to teach guys to be, be cool too. Let's all get along and make this money and, and hustle off the streets. And you got guys making what makes the Detroit family so much some like New York, and there's so much different. It's not even really the same thing. Yes, it's mafia. Yes, it's Costa Nostra, but that's where the, the similarities end. You're not uh, you're not allowed to like boast and brag. Look at me, I'm in the mafia. I'm with this guy. I'm with that yeah. guy, and you know, that, that will get you killed in Detroit. Um, what they really want to do is just m- make money and 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 then be left alone. And the big difference is the high level guys. And there's, you know, a handful of them, maybe 10 of them or a dozen of them. But then you got the boss, the underboss, consigliere, street boss, and four or five capital regimes. These are the bosses. Their goal is to is to groom and cultivate connections in the courts, meaning judges, prosecutors, sure. police, federal agents, ATF agents, IRS agents, um, pr- prosecutors, judges. That's what they do. So they may take years and years and years of getting in with these people a little bit of bribery here. They may even pay for, you know, a guy to go to school, law school, and they know he's a friend of the family, but not close enough to be associated directly. I'll pay for your law school and I'll help, you know, when you when you run to, for, for judge 10 years from now, we'll back you up with the unions to vote for you. And right. once you get in, once you get on the stand, you know, maybe someday you do us a favor. One of our guys get in front of you and you, you know, hey, you, so- you find a technicality or something. Uh, you know, when you got this steroid case now, uh, you know, what people don't understand also is the feds also take five, 10 years to build a case against people. They have unlimited yeah. resources. They can sit back and watch, <clears throat> maybe participate on some level for five or 10 yeah. years. And then when it, when it comes down, it's like, bam, you know, they yeah. have, they like to build a solid case. So. You got busted. Uh, it sounds like you were, uh, you know, you got busted uh, because of a case like that. Like they were trying to yeah, crack the yeah. guys up. You know, they were trying to crack as many guys as they could, as high up the ladder as they could. And you got wrapped up into that. So how much time did you get for that? Not much, dude. You know, so so the, the big federal case that was being put together for DiMaggio and his crew didn't involve me. I was such a small fry. So I ended up doing a hand hand delivery with a couple cases of steroids, you know, seven thousand dollars worth of steroids um, to a separate dude who was working for uh, who was set me up with an undercover agent, which was a local narcotics task for um, Comet right. out of Roseville, Roseville Michigan. Um, they didn't bust me because they had followed me to DiMaggio's house. Right. And DiMaggio was under surveillance. I mean, his house was wired up. He's under surveillance. They know who I am because I call Joe all the time. I'm like, can I come over and use the tanning bed, which was code for to pick up some drugs? And he was like, yeah, come on over. You know? And I go over there. I was very respectful, man. I was only like 17 years old. I I mean, I looked like a little wise guy. I mean, I'd, I'd show up in a shirt and tie, suit on, you know, dress real nice. And, I just, and he was a wise guy. And all his boys were wise guys. And he liked me. And the only reason he dealt with me is because he knew my uncles. I approached him on a whole whimsical thing where I was getting steroids through a friend of mine from him, this big dude named Jerry Gadette, but that dude got a, a baseball scholarship and he left. And now I didn't have a connection to get steroids. So I approached him in the gym. I said, you know, Joe, this guy's like the Godfather. And I'm walk up right up to him in the gym. I'm like, Hey man, listen, you know, can I have a word with you in the locker room? I never spoke a word to the dude, but he knew who I was, you know, it's kind of a small gym. 
And this gym was the most steroid infested gym in America. That's what they claim. <laughs> and I walk in the back and I was like, listen, man, I was getting everything that, you know, all the stuff Jerry was getting was for me. And he kind of said, you know, Jerry, I didn't realize how much Jerry was getting. Jerry was getting a ton. And only a little bit was for me, but I made it sound like it was a lot. And so then I'm like, you know, Pete, I'm Pete Toko's nephew, you know, Pete Toko. Right. And, and he's, he's like, about your age. He's like, sales brother i said yeah yeah my mom's grace toko man he's like yeah i know my mother he's like he's like I, my our jewelry shops in gross point right by where you guys grew up i was like yeah yeah, yeah it's me. he's like well listen man here's my number give me a call and uh we'll come on by and we'll work it out so i went through his house and he had this like you know huge safe filled with steroids and anything i wanted and one at one point man he um he, there was a weed drought and he had a plug and he, had, he was like the only guy around that had good weed so he started selling, selling me weed and and uh, when they busted him, they said it was like, I think they said they got $4 million in cash, 40 million doses of steroids, 100 weapons, 10,000 rounds of ammunition, a couple kilos of coke, yada, yada, yada. It was yeah. just big. It was a big thing. thing. But he got out of it. He, he paid a fortune and was able to bribe, pay, whatever, get his way out of it. He still went to pr- jail for like a 18 months and had probation. But yeah. but he, he, got, he got out of it. So, I mean, God bless so, so yeah, that was kind of the first real charge. I on the state charge for me, I only got like uh, three months. Mo- well, I got six months work release because the bribery of the judge. My grandpa, brought, you know, gave the judge ten racks, and then I, I when I was in work release, I got kicked out of work release because I jury rigged up my schedule to try to spend a day with my girlfriend so I could get some. And then that was my first warning strike. And the second one was I was in the jail eating. This black dude sits across the table from me. We're in the little the you know the the, the room where you eat you know it's kind of a it's still jail you only get to leave to go to freaking work and he's like let me get that cookie man i'm like no nah, man i'm eating my cookie and he's like let me get that little freaking i was only you know 19 year old kid you know i was i was i was buff dude i was worked out but i was still little i was 180 pounds and he's <laughs> yeah. like he reaches over and grabs my cookie off my tray and i'm just like yep. there, I, ju- I jump yeah. yeah i jump straight over the tail wham just knocked him off the freaking thing start wailing on him. boom so they they kicked me off the freaking out of the um out of the they, out of work release. And I had to go in the tower and I spent the next day. But I got a time cut, so I only did three months total. Yeah. Um, and the, and then so then I got out, and this is where it's a pivotal turning point for me in my life because when I got out, I was 20 years old, and I was living with my grandparents, and it's around the time where I mean, there's a lot of stuff happening right now in my life as far as like the mob intersection. Um, and what a reason for it was is all these freaking mob guys, they'd known I, at 15 years old, I was expelled from school. All right. Indefinitely kicked out by 16 yeah. years old. I've been to the youth home a couple of times, got a couple of felony, you know, assaults at 16 years old. I got another felonious assault at 17 years old. I get busted with the steroids and at 19 years old, I get, a, I, you know, I, I go to jail for the steroids and now I get out. So now all these old wise guys in my family. They all know who I am. They're all, they all, you know, are familiar with my, you know, my history, my background. I mean, they're, they're my uncle, basically. Yeah. They're just, they're all my uncles. And, you know, some of my cousins. So now my cousins who are kind of, even though they're coming up young wise guys, they're like kind of nerdy wise guys, meaning they're not violent dudes. They're not doing time in jail. They're not on the streets. They're not beating nobody up. They're just like hustlers or kind of. They're like, all right, I'm involved in the mafia because my dad is so-and-so. And 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 I'll work these rackets in a sports book and loan shark. And I'll, you know, manipulate my family name to get this contract and that contract. But I'm not like my cousin Alonzo, who's out there smashing people's faces in, you know, who don't pay up $50 to the bookie. So they they were all scared of me. Then these old men, I started to be, you know, I'd known my whole life to come to our house to have dinner and have coffee and hang out and then the weekends to watch football with my grandpa and they'd have four phones going they'd be booking bets and it was kind of their hobby they'd make all this money from it but what happened was because there were women around they would act like you know my uncles and then what happened was my grandpa started saying in his mind listen Alonzo's not going to go to college he's not going to be a freaking you know college boy he's not going to end up freaking you know being some professional I mean the guy's been a freaking bad kid so yeah they were like, this guy's been a, this guy was a bad kid since day one. So, I mean, and I had been expelled from every school, everything I'd ever been. I mean, I beat up a kid on my second game of kindergarten with a building block who was bullying some other kids. Yeah. I picked up a building block and started smashing this freaking like big Luca Brasi looking kid. And anyways, so they just knew. So now my grandpa says, come on, 
you know, Alonzo, come with me. We're going to go to the market. And in Detroit, you have what's called the Easter Market, which is kind of like Detroit's Little Italy. And um, and like it's where all the day market kind of thing. Yeah, no, not really. No, it's it's it's. I mean, there's that on the weekends. They have a giant like farmers market, but it's no. There's it, it's like a one square mile uh, area in downtown Detroit where it's nothing but produce and food wholesalers right. and businesses. And then they have this big pavilion that kind of in the, in the middle of a big pavilion. And they have a huge farmer's market every Saturday and Sunday and so stuff. It's but, like uh, like the old school uh, Italian kind of place. Yeah, that's all it is. It's an old yeah. school Italian brick yeah. market. It looks right out of a movie. It's just so everything is Italian owned, for like a square mile, every business. And if you if you're not Italian owned business, you're paying the Italians to have a business there. You're not going to have a business in the Eastern market unless you're paying them up. That's it. I mean, yeah. and then I don't care. They don't care who you are, but you're going to pay or you're going to leave. Yeah. And that's that. And so anyways, so, so um, I would go, the, go the picture I kind of get like, you know, everybody thinks, uh, you know, Italian mafia, you know, uh, they watch the Godfather and, you know, whatever their image is like the way I see it is like, you know, I'm from California. And California, especially like Los Angeles, is pretty racially divided. And, and so, like, it, it kind of reminds me of, like, where I grew up, they have a Chicano neighborhood, Logan Heights. You know, it's old school. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not ghetto, but it's not, you know, it's like a, a barrio, you know, where the, yeah, the, yeah, that's their hood. That's their spot. So everybody knows everybody. Some yeah. guys are involved with crime. Some guys aren't. And all the Guy, all the dudes that are, you know, gangsters, you know, they live there. They know everybody there. Everybody knows everybody. And, you know, like if uh, somebody could got something going on, they'll uh, rub the hand of the guy up top a little bit or whatever. Is that kind of how the, the Italian thing is out there? It's yeah. Like I mean, to a, and neighborhood. To a degree. Yeah. It's definitely like that. No, I mean, yeah. the thing is, the market is downtown Detroit. And so once you leave that downtown area, you're in the black ghetto for like yeah. 10 miles in every direction. But you get, you go up Jefferson, you know, seven, eight, nine miles, and then you're in Gross Point where we live. And that's the whole neighborhood, uh, the border neighborhood of Gross Point, Detroit, was all Italians. So it was nothing but freaking wealthy Italians and business owners in the entire hierarchy of the Detroit mob lived in that, like in a five block radius, everybody. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'd say 98% of them. You had, you had some guys that lived down river and a few guys that live on the West side, but eventually they started merging. They started leaving, um, especially as the old men retired and sold their businesses in their market. They just didn't want to go downtown no more, man, yeah. because every time you go downtown, you park, somebody steals your car or somebody, you know, got robbed, you got jumped. My grandma, man, some, some freaking crackhead ran up and punched her in the face, tried to steal her freaking five-carat ring. She fought him off. But she was in Gross Point, but she was only a block from Detroit when it happened. So they just, they said, we're moving. And everybody started moving. Even though it's still nice in Gross Point, you got all these crackheads and freaking dope fiends and animals coming in to freaking rob and steal. So they just left. So there's, there's but downtown in the Eastern Market, um, you don't have that type of behavior. Because even the black dudes down there are super like they're they're like mob extensions, and they're not going to handle. They're you know, they're not nobody's going to come in there doing stuff like that and get yeah, away with it. Cool. There's some, yeah. Well, they're gangsters too, though. I mean, there's there's uh, there's a guy named Bert. He owns Bert's Theater Warehouse down down there, and, and and dude, he he's been you know working with the mob for 50, 60 years, and like they. They gave him a choice, stay or pay. And he's like, and I said, you're still here, huh? And he's I'm like, you're still paying. He laughed. He's like, yeah, but the thing is, he's not going to let these freaking punks come in there and try to act like animals. That ain't going to happen because he's he, he's got friends too, and they all got friends. So, But anyways, I would go down to this market with my grandpa to usually to pick money up um, from bookies. And what would happen, because every single market, meaning there's like these warehouses and their businesses, they sell meat and produce and vegetables and blah, 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 every one of them. So inside of each one of them, there's like a loading dock. You pull up and the, the trucks pull up and they either unload stuff or they load stuff coming and going, orders coming all day. And inside you go inside and there's like, um, 
you know, like a lounge area, you know, where there might be a pool table there and a, a table and chairs and a refrigerator with a sink and stuff like a little kitchenette and guys would hang out, smoke cigars and just play po penny poker all day. You know, play dice and just hang out and bullshit. These old Italians, they love to talk. That's all they do. They love to sit around and bullshit. That's what they did. So I would show up with my grandpa who was a heavyweight layoff book. I mean, heavyweight. And they all, he was an old man. He was older than most of these guys. So they all, all the freaking bookies and everybody, the cousins and uncles, they really looked up to him. And I'd show up with him. Like I'd be his driver. And I eventually became his driver. And they'd all be like, they'd be sitting there and they're like, they like, hey, Pete, hey, Alonzo, you know, what happened with you the other day? I heard you busted up Joe's place. You know, about some fight I got in with, you know, and they're like, yeah, it's a long story. They're like, well, what do you mean? What's happened? You know? Ah, this guy disrespected my boy. He said something to him. And was the next thing you know, we're, we're all fighting. We're trashing the place, busting the place up. And then they're like, well, yeah, I heard you just busted up Nikki's place a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, yeah, you know, this guy was threatening to smack his girl around. So I hit him with a chair. Da, da, da. And they're laughing. So they're like, oh, I remember the time I did this and I did that. And then they're like, you know what? Next thing you know, we're in there all laughing and telling stories and sharing. And I'm kind of bonding with these guys. These are the same guys that would come to my house for, for coffee and, 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 uh, not the cookies or dinner on but they'd act differently they weren't they were gangsters now at home they're in front of the women and the kids they were just uncles now they were they were gangsters and they knew they were dealing with one in me and you just got out of jail they knew i just got out of jail they knew i'd done all this, all this trouble i had flown as assault i've been in jail i've been kicked out of school but so now they're like okay this kid's coming our way and so eventually around 20 my grandpa's eyes started going bad. I have bad eyes too, by the way. So I oftentimes will wear glasses because I'm light sensitive and wear the sunglasses. But, but anyways, I'll take them off for now. But anyways, my, my grandpa's eyes started going bad. And so he kept like smashing cars basically. And so, and when I went down, I was with him, it blew a freaking red light like three times. I was like, grandpa, you're going to kill us. I said, from now on, when you got to go to the market or go see your Gumbadis, which is his boys, I said, just let me drive you, you know? So next thing you know, I'm driving them and I'm going to the, the, the headquarters of these um, these mob bosses. And then I'm getting to rub elbows with guys that like normally nobody at my level would ever even get to talk to, even though they were my uncles outside of my house where they come in and they, they might say, hey, Alonzo, how you doing, buddy? You know what I mean? That's it. And they'd sit down and talk in Italian with my grandpa and my grandmother, maybe have some food and then leave. Maybe I'd see him at a wedding or a graduation or a funeral or a party but I wouldn't really get to talk to him in, in the gangster light. And now I'm with my grandpa and they're like, you know, and I'm telling them these stories, you know, man, smash this freaking guy. You could have seen better. I heard you did this. I heard you do that. Blah, blah. So now they're telling me their stories. I'm telling them. And they kind of binded with me. I bonded with me. And before you know it, one of them who was like the, really the top dog of them all, not, not the boss, the boss never really had me do nothing except once the boss, Jack Toko was like, you know, like the Godfather, you're not going to get near him. He's like a Marlon Brando type of figure. He, he don't talk to nobody about nothing. You know, the guy's worth a hundred million dollars. He don't talk mob business with anybody, but maybe two or three guys. And they just come up, whisper in his ears, what's going on the streets, hand him a hundred thousand bucks a month, 200,000 bucks an envelope. And they say, you know, God bless you. You're the Godfather. You don't have to worry. We'll take care of the streets. So he was a different level. And then, and then the, the underboss was a guy who was kind of estranged from his for the boss. And I didn't, I don't think he liked me. And I didn't really like him. I kind of thought he was a freaking little putsy douchebag because his crew, I knew some of his crew and they were all dunces. <clears throat> they were just kind of free, kind of, I don't know, they were like misfits to me in my mind, anyways. And they were, turned out they were. And one of them ended up turning into a rat. But and then, and then they had the consigliere. I didn't really know him, but he was actually a great uncle who lived down river. And then after that, the street boss was Tony was really the like to me, the boss of the family, because he was the face of the mob in Detroit, Tony Giacalone and his brother, Billy, who I didn't really know well. And the reason why I knew Tony is because Tony's daughter married my cousin. Uh, Tony's daughter, Nita, married Tony, my cousin, Tony, and I, who I didn't really know that well. But but anyways, because of that, Tony was close to my grandpa and he was hearing things about me. And then one day when I was with them, he. he um. At one time, I ended up sticking up for his, his um, nephew, uh, and, I, and I threatened these guys. If they were picking on his nephew, I'd freaking stomp them all, and then that kind of made him, that kind of piqued his interest in me. And then one day, he called me and asked me to freaking to, to, to hurt this guy who was, who was the, the um, ex-husband of his girlfriend, and 
or I don't want to say for sure his girlfriend. I'm assuming it was his girlfriend. I, didn't, I don't want to disrespect my cousins or his family, but I used to say I, it was a girl that he was friends with. And he says, listen, you know, this guy came home and slapped her around. I want you to handle it. And I did. And I went and freaking demolished the guy. I freaking, I just went and I pulverized him. You know what I'm saying? And, and it did it with force. And I did it quickly. I did it. Like yeah. he gave me a call and 20 minutes later, she called him and said, I don't know who that guy was, but he, he came here and just obliterated this dude. I had a big gold ring on me and my boy showed up. my boy didn't really help me. He hit him with a pool stick after I like knocked him out and started stomping him. But anyway, so after that, Tony started laying, yeah, you want to work security at poker games and you want to do this and help me collect. And I got these bookies and these, these high level, like Jewish bookies and, 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 and Chaldean bookies. I mean, high level. These are guys that are making, they have more rank and status than 75% of the freaking like mob guys in the city. Well, it's because um, they're making I, money, right? Exactly. And it's because they're making big money, big money. money and they're, they're, so they, they were untouchable. I mean, like they put it like this. If one of them, I know an instance where, um, one, one, one made guy had gotten a fight with one of them and, um, and the made guy ended up dead, not the Jew dude. So I'm just saying it's, it's, it's just, these guys were untouchable because of Tony and, um, never mess with the money. You Never mess with the money. These guys are pulling millions, bro. I mean, their sports book was it was like, you know, you're talking $10 million a year. And, you know, Tony's getting probably a million of it, you know. So, and you now the boss would get a, you know, a big chunk too. But at the end of the day, these guys were, were banking. So what they would do is use me like a junkyard dog. And if the bookies were having trouble with other bookies that weren't paying up or guys that weren't paying or, you know, you know, the sharks, whatever it was, they would, um, Tony would basically assign me to them. And then they would call me. And then I would, I would either, sometimes they would kind of almost forget about me. And I would hear from them for a couple of weeks and I'd go see him. I'm like, what's up guys? You got any work? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. I got this guy, that guy, that guy. And it became my MO was to go track these down, these guys down that owed money, you know? And um, the way it worked was if I got paid, got them to pay, I got paid. Um, but if they didn't pay, then, then I didn't get paid. So I got good at finding ways to make them pay, which was essentially, I would, I would, you know, I'd, if they didn't have the money, I'd find, you know, I'd have them go and borrow the money from their aunt, cash in a 401k, sell their car, sell a snowmobile, sell a boat. I don't care what you did, but you got to pay. And I, I, you know, under the threat of violence, you got to pay. And, and they knew who I was there, who I represented. And, and sometimes they didn't even know that the, the bookie was backed by like Tony or Freddie or Al or one of these guys. And I'd say, you know, you know, Tony sent me, Tony Hugh. I'd say, I'm Tony Jack. He's like, wait a minute, I'm betting with so-and-so. I'm like, yeah, who do you think he's, who do you think he's under? Who do you think he's with? And now they're like, oh, no. I'm like, yeah, it's that serious. If they send me, I'm the second to last result, meaning you got to pay. You can't run. You can't hide. You can't disappear. You know what I'm saying? You, these are people that are not going to go away, though. You got to pay. So how can we make this, you know, make this right? Only a few times that I ever actually have to punch a guy. Like he, I, a couple times where a guy got disrespectful, like F off once and I'll tell you, F you, I'm paying you who to F you. And I, I punch him in the mouth. Another time a guy, I, I was supposed to come back in an hour. He had these bikers. I came back with, an hour later to this little bar, little social club. And um, he had these three bikers with him. And I said, okay, you got the money. And he's like, nah, I ain't paying. And, and no, they came over and said, well, he ain't paying shit. No, he ain't paying you. Nobody, he ain't paying nobody, not you, not anybody. And I looked at the dude. I said, sure, that's what you want to do, man. That's your choice. And he kind of shrugs. I said, okay. I walked back out, great baseball bat, came back in, you know, I, I smashed him. I, I came running in with a baseball bat and, you know, hurt them, hurt a couple of them real bad. But normally I wouldn't have to do that. I'd just be like, yeah, he's like, you got a boat? Yeah, I got a boat. Let's go sell the boat, man. Yeah. Let's get the money, man. So, okay, so you know, coin uh, collections. So, you, yeah, so you're working your way into this uh, situation of basically you're getting in a little deeper with the criminal activities, meeting people. So you brought up bikers. I want to ask you, uh, what's a biker situation with uh, all that kind of stuff out there? Oh, bikers. Bikers is a huge part of Detroit, man. Huge part. Um, I, I got some stories. We don't have time to get into all of them. Maybe yeah, we have to do another show. Yeah. But, but I will say this, that the mafia in Detroit and the bikers work hand in hand. They're very synonymous. Have you ever heard of Taco Bowman in the Outlaws? Oh, yeah. So, so Taco Bowman and the Outlaws were basically extension of the mob in Detroit. That's, that's what they did. The, Taco Bowman got his ass freaking run out of Detroit because he tried to flip. Um, he basically wanted the muscle Tony Jackaloni, who I'm talking about, and the Toko family out of the cocaine business. 
and he went to somebody and said, an Italian guy whose loyalty, he's a, a made guy under, under uh, that Jack Toco. His name is Anthony Cirillo. I was in prison with him for four years, an old Dago. Um, and he said, listen, we're going to freaking muscle. We're going to muscle the Dagos out of the freaking Coke business here in Detroit. And so you're going to help us. He tells the Dago this. Now, the Dago says to himself, you can't win this war and you never will. But he kind of plays along and he goes, reports it back to the boss, the Italians. So they say, they set him up. You got to kill them all. And so they set up this freaking ambush and uh, they don't get him. Taco don't show up, but they kill some of the other guys. And then Taco ends up running. I don't know the whole story. I hung around Taco's nephew for a while. Um, and he was a little, little gangster, you know, kind of more of a gangster wannabe than anything. But, but anyways, I heard that Taco bought his way out of his own hit. This is the only time I've ever heard this, that this type of thing happening that, that he basically said, when he's in prison, they said, I got to get you, man. You're dead. Anyways, wherever you go, you're dead. And he, that he said, I'll, I'll give you everything I got in exchange for, you know, a pass, which was 750,000 bucks. That's just a rumor. I don't know for sure, but you know, I just heard that. You know, you hear possibility you never know yeah i don't know but what the bikers so i did some work with the bikers on and off mostly yeah. outlaws there was highway men my my uncle was an outlaw biker so my uncle pete toko who was my boss my capo my like you know not, not technically capo he's just my in my mind my capo but he was my mother's brother my mother's younger brother he was only 12 yeah. years older than me so he was he was basically like an older brother to me not a not an uncle he was only 12 years more than me and he's the one who brought me into this whole thing he's the one who introduced me to a life of crime the uh, bending the law you know, bending the rules the gray area scams hustles it was all him the drug business all he did it he taught me it all and he was an outlaw biker so all his boys were these outlaw bikers and they were killers I mean, they were, they were, they were like, there was, there's one instance I'll tell you, and I've told the story on my YouTube channel and, you know, people got to check out my YouTube channel. I got some insane oh, stories. Yeah. And here's, here's one of my, one, just a clip from one of them was my uncle. There was this dude, I could say his name. I can't say his name, but he was kind of a big mouth. Um, one of those guys who like to brag about being connected to the mob, you know, one of those guys, you know, I was like, Oh, I'm connected. You know, I'm with this guy and I'm with that guy. And, and he's always talking loud and bragging, which is a no-no in Detroit. It's just a no-no. You can't yeah. do it. You just don't do it. You don't do that. Now it's a, it's really just the family. That's why they keep it within the family. It's just cousins, and uncles, I think that's and a no-no in just about any organization. You know, it's all about talking. Shut up. Yeah. So this guy was running his mouth. He was in the strip club. He was telling, trying to impress some stripper. He was with his boys. He's like, yeah, yeah. And I'm with, I'm with Pete Toko, and I'm with these guys. And this, you know, we're doing it. And the stripper, smart chick, she knows that the guy running the place, his name is Nino. I knew him. Um, he, he's a connected guy, you know. And so she goes up to him. She said, you know, this freaking guy, he's over here popping his mouth. He's saying this. He's running. This. He's saying he's with this guy and that guy. And that. So Nino calls my uncle or calls his boss, who's Tony, actually, same Tony we're talking about, who calls my uncle and says, this freaking guy, he's got to go. This guy's with the freaking loud mouth, you know? And so my uncle tells me, you got to you gotta kill him. And I'm like, I'm not killing him, man. You know, and that was the that was the benefit of the, the bonus of not being a made guy, where I could just say, F you. And that's the benefit of being family, where if a regular guy in the street, they said, you got to kill him, and you said, no, they kill you. That's it. Because now you're a loose end. Not only did you, you know, defy an order, but now you also know that we we are trying to kill him, and you said you wouldn't right. do it, so you're you're out there. You could tell, so they'll kill you on the spot. But for me, it was like my uncle. I'm like, F you, I'm not killing this freaking guy, man. There's no freaking way, you know what I mean? And and so they ended up um, getting the bikers to do it. So they got the bikers to do it, and then about a couple of weeks go by, and and um. My uncle calls me over He's at home. I'm, I'm somewhere. And he calls me home. I think I was living with my grandparents at the time. So he was living there too. And he calls me in. He's like, um, you got to go freaking identify the body. They say they got him. I'm like, why the frick would I got to go, go to? Like, why do I got to go identify? You go to identify the body. He's like, no, nah, you got to do it. That's what you got to do. It's like, you know, all the stuff that I've done for you, he says. And he had helped me make a lot of money. He helped me get out of a lot of trouble. He had always had my back. Helped me. I'm like, all right, man. So he tells me where it is. It's in the ghetto in Detroit, in the hood. So it's an abandoned house, an abandoned garage, an abandoned house on this street. So it's a red garage between these two streets, uh, you know, side streets. So he's like, go down there. So it's like middle of summer. It's, it's like 90 degrees. And I pull down the street. I got a, I got a black tinted Mustang GT. You know, with a big sound system in it. And I come ripping up 
and I'm looking and I kind of know where I'm looking because he said there's a vacant lot then a, a abandoned house with a red garage it's kind of dilapidated that's what the bikers told him so he tells me that and I see it I, okay this is it and I pull up and I remember looking around and there's people like on their porches sitting around like these black dudes are sitting across the street got music playing drinking a 40 you know smoking I look over here there's two other guys on the porch two houses down like they're looking at I'm a white dude in the hood you just pulled up in a tricked out Mustang kind of dressed on right now with a gold chain and jump out of my Mustang and start walking up into this backyard everybody in the neighborhood's looking at me they're like what the frick is this white boy doing in the middle of the hood freaking you know walking up in the backyard of some freaking and uh and then I walked up, I could smell it, you know, before I even got to the door, the, the garage, I knew I was in the right place. And I looked in and, and, and they, I see it, Tim, it's Tim. And, and they had the bullet had, there was two entry, there was, they hit shot him twice. And so you could tell it done, you know, like one of the bullets had not, not penetrated the way they wanted it, like took off a hunk of the head. And anyways, they started, and then I remember saying, why did they freaking like blow his head off the way they did? And he said, oh, he wasn't, you know, the, the first shot uh, didn't do the job, so they they had to finish it with a second one. And they then they joked about it. Years later, they would they would joke about it because they call them bullet head. So every time they heard somebody who was like running their mouth, said they're gonna end up like bullet head. They're gonna end up like bullet head. This guy's gonna end up like bullet head. And it was like their inside. I'm saying, but uh, but yeah, the bikers did that, and so that's the type of the bikers were real powerful. They had tons of money. They ran gambling joints, drugs, you know, what I'm saying extortion yeah. rackets, same, almost like the mob. So while you're getting involved with all this stuff, like you're getting older, right? Getting a little more deeper into shit. Uh, you're getting uh, more contact with law enforcement, or they like uh, on you on the radar. You get did you get eventually you end up going to prison, right? Oh yeah, dude. I was in and out of jail for years. You know, the cops were all over me. They just, they, they just smothered me. I was constantly under investigation, constantly being pulled over, constantly being arrested. I mean, I've been arrested 38 times. So, I mean, most of the time was for petty crap. Then I get a ticket for something. I wouldn't pay it and I go to a warrant and the cops all knew me, but they could, they couldn't pin me down. I wouldn't even get into all the different times. They almost got me, but most of it was for like drug sales and stuff like that. And they were watching me. I was on wiretaps. I was on FBI, FBI surveillance footage and, you know, stuff like that. They just didn't know to what degree. And when they did question me several times about things, I'd be like, like, you know, what are you doing with this guy? I'm like, he's my uncle. Why are you with him? Because he's my uncle. We were going to go out to lunch or hang out or whatever. I'm like, I don't have to explain nothing to you. You got some kind of something to freaking charge me with if not then i'll f you i don't i'm not talking to you then i can have the rock and hang out with my uncle oh, see you go up to the athletic club right there and you and tony jack go outside and you go for a walk i'm like yeah he goes out to have a cigarette so i'm gonna have you know talk to him i'm gonna wait for him in there i'm out there to see i went there stop there to see him and uh anyway stuff like that i mean but um i had some a couple cases i got busted with a bunch of weed um at one point 18 pounds of weed uh, and, and then I got another time, got busted with a, it was a pretty big dope case. I won't even get into how big it was. Yeah. And people don't believe it, probably, probably won't even believe it. It wasn't like huge, but it was a couple hundred grand worth. Um, but it was fronted to me. And, um, and so I ended up owing a bunch. So I ended up having to rob another dope dealer to pay that freaking guy because the guy that I owed was a mob guy. And then, so I ended up robbing this black dude of a hundred pounds of really good weed to pay the freaking mob guy. Cause I was more worried about the mob guy, you know, owing the mob guy to freaking money than, than, than this freaking black dude. So anyway, well, people, sign it. People don't understand. Like uh, a lot of guys think, Hey, I'm going to get in a dope game, make a bunch of money. And you know, they come up on, you know, whatever ounces of this pounds of that, whatever it is. And if they get cracked, they lose that dope. They don't make the money. Somebody burns them, whatever. They're still on the hook for that dope. And they have yeah, to pay yeah. for that. And if they Bro, don't pay I, cash, they're going to pay it, you know. Yeah, you're going to pay. Other way. I, I, um, I told a story on my YouTube channel. Um, it's, I think the name of the show is called The Sit Down Gone Wrong, where this dude um, lost 400 pounds of weed of really high end weed. So this is, you're talking easy half million dollars. I think it was $600,000 worth of weed, um, 400 pounds of weed that belonged to a, a pretty high level mob guy, young guy, but he was coming up and he wasn't, wasn't a made dude, but 
might as well have been because his uncle and dad were. And so anyways, the guy who lost the weed um, owned a business. So they decided they're going to take the business. That guy's dad was friends with another wise guy. And that wise guy stepped in and tried to say, no, I'm not taking this business because I seeded this business. He owes me 200 grand. So if you think, and I saw, and before and they got me moderating this whole freaking thing. And I don't even really know why, because I'm friends with both parties, I guess. And they trust me. And it all ended up with, ended in a big freaking shootout. And, um, which nobody died from the shootout. No, thank God. Uh, I ended up running out the door, but Tony got shot five times, but the guy who tried to stick touch the old maid dude ended up murdered a couple months later. And then the other younger guy who got, to, he ended up with the businesses, which was the plan in the beginning. So just kind of the idea is like, yes, you don't, if you don't pay me for the money for the weed, I'm taking something. Somebody's going to pay, you know what I'm saying? And he did. And the, the sad result was, it seems like, I don't know for sure, but the guy who was murdered a few months later who tried to intervene, uh, you know, he cost him his life unless it was unrelated, which I can't say for sure one way or another, but, but anyway, so yeah. And when I was, um, around, so, so around, so the interesting thing is maybe not interesting at all, really is the fact that over the years from age like 20 to, um, the day I got locked up, I had a, a on off on off again, drug habit, not major drug, but it was a drug habit. So it was always some kind of trauma would set up. You know, my mom died when I was 19 and I started taking like Tylenol threes. Right. And I was, got hooked on them and no big deal. And then I went to jail for the, for the steroid thing and I get out and, and then, and then I, um, now so a few years go by and, um, I think it was my, my, my best friend dies, right? Literally my best friend dies. And, um, this habit of mine, um, uh, around 24 my best friend dies i start taking pills and it leads to like a heroin addiction and then i go to jail for like two weeks i get cleaned up you know two weeks for a gun i get caught with a gun i go to jail for a couple of weeks I get out of it you know get a, judge, a lawyer get out of it i'm back on my feet good for a couple of years i break my ankle and that was kind of the final straw when i broke my ankle they gave me some pain pills and it was a long story but anyways for like the next year and a half of my life um it just spiral that now i just bought my second house had a bunch of you know i had every toy you can imagine I had a dirt bike four-wheeler snowmobile jet ski jet boats you know you two of everything I had two or three cars and a nice couple houses i mean i was living life but i was living way beyond my means and i started gambling like a dumbass like who does that i, mean, I was taught to never never gamble as a kid my uncle nicky taught me always be the house only a fool or sucker bets and i was like hey one day with the vegas i got a little extra money I'm like, hey, let me drop some money at these tables. I won like 14 grand. I'm like, damn, this is easy. And I got kind of hooked on that whole rush. And uh, and then I lost, you know, I looked a couple of years, I lost a couple hundred grand. But um, but anyway, so this the last year and a half of my free life was this, you know, I had this very uh, extravagant kind of lifestyle. I just got engaged to get married. My girlfriend didn't know nothing. Like she knew I was she suspected I was up. She always, I'd been with her for 13 years. So she knew I was like in the streets. She didn't know what or to what degree. And she didn't want to know. She didn't ask. She didn't care. I mean, just, you come home to me every day and, you know, watch a movie and you're normal. I know something's going on because 99% of your life, you don't work. You got money. There's money for your bills. You got nice cars. You're out in the street. You know I mean? Every, you know, just whatever. But she was just happy by that time point in my life. I like stopped going to nightclubs and strip clubs and crap. You know, I, and I, until I was like 26, 27 years old, I might go to the night off to these nightclubs, you know, two, three times a week, you know, strip clubs were more like just to rob people. I go to strip clubs and people are like, uh, you're in the strip club, you're in Mac and hose. I'm like, I get girls numbers, but now in the strip club, all I was doing was looking for a mark. You know, if you see a guy in there flashing a bunch of money and, you know, and he got a freaking big platinum gold chain and a freaking, you know, 10 grand in his pocket, I just wait for him to leave, you know, and follow him and then rob him. You know what I'm saying? It was easy money, but, um, it's just one of my MOs. And we we had girls who worked in the strip clubs who would tip us, you know. Yeah. We, you know, I'd be at home sitting there or whatever. And the girl would call me like, yeah, we got, I got these two dudes in here. They got freaking at least 10, 15 grand on them. They're popping bottles and telling us they're, they're going to take us to Bahamas and making it rain. They got an Escalade parked outside after blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right, cool. Freaking, uh, you know, tell them that what you do is after work, tell them you're going to go with them. And then you take them to, uh, you know, either I'll take them to the hotel on such and such, you know what I'm saying? And, and then when they take them to the hotel on such and such, I mean, I, they jump out of the car, like, hey, got some, you know, they're all happy. And I'm, we run up and like, you know, on the ground and take the money. 
but but um and the girls were all like oh please don't shoot you know because they, they they did act like they didn't know it was just a they, they never put two and two together so anyways the moral of the story is i ended up um living beyond my means at that point and ended up in um my life spun spiraled out of control and then the last several months and um and then i just ended up like just not really giving a crap no more, man. Not, I didn't even care. I just, I was out robbing, stealing, extorting. Did, didn't care. I didn't care. I knew I was going to be dead either from an overdose or somebody's going to kill me because I was making a lot of enemies. And um, even my family had turned their back on me. Nobody wanted nothing to do with me. And naturally so. I was acting like an asshole. My, my cousin Johnny had killed a couple of drug dealers. And, um, and, it, and then like word got back to my uncle that, that we were seen with those drug before murders you know we didn't you know we were never investigated or nothing like that but my uncle wasn't stupid you know what i'm saying you know what i'm saying so my, my uncle was just like man what are you doing man you guys are freaking out of control he's like i could see it from johnny but that's saying you man you know he said yeah i can't help you you got you know, what you're doing is i can't help if you get in trouble there's nothing we can do and i'm like yeah whatever you know i kind of blew him off and just was like yeah, i'll do what i want and then so and i ended up getting locked up and a couple months a couple weeks later maybe a couple months later I ended up uh, in 2000 in February 2003. I was uh, arrested and and charged with um, 17 capital crimes that ranged from extortion and bank robbery to uh, kidnapping and armed robberies and gun weapons violations. On and on and on. It was a ton of crap. And I ended up um, getting sentenced to 13 to 50 years. And uh, yeah, that was the end of my run, man. I was 29 years old. Right. So.